Thank you very much. Uh, again, welcome everyone to the first in, or the second in our lecture series called Celebrating Portland, Our Story Through Architecture. My name is Hilary Bassett and I'm Executive Director of Greater Portland Landmarks. And I'm so glad to hear, to see all of you here. Uh, we are delighted to have the second in our series of lectures. And just a reminder that Greater Portland Landmark's mission is to preserve and revitalize Greater Portland's remarkable legacy of historic buildings, neighborhoods, landscapes, and parks. He was born in Norway, Maine, and I just learned through a great article in the, in the Portland Sun, the, the, the previous newspaper for Portland, that he went to a one-room schoolhouse. Uh, and also that he had a chance as a young person to meet Governor Percival Baxter. And that is where Herb got inspired to spend his career in the study of history and public service. And he has continued to do that. He is a, uh, in, on the faculty at Southern Maine Community College as a professor of social science. Um, and then he has served on many, many volunteer committees, the Portland School Committee, Portland Friends of the Parks, Parkside Neighborhood Association, and he was an eight-term member of the Maine House of Representatives serving Portland's District 119. He is a very special person. I think you'll really enjoy his presentation tonight, and I would like to thank Herb for being here and welcoming, welcome him as our speaker. Thank you. I did know Governor Baxter. <laughs> he was governor almost 100 years ago, but I was lucky to be among the raft of his little kid friends, the last raft of them, a wonderful man and worthy of a lecture another night. It is a sweet September day. It is late fall, September 28th, 1844. We are standing at the far end of Four Street an old Portland town, next to Captain Stevenson's mansion. He is suffering us all to stand on his lawn, our big crowd. It's across uh, Forest Street, where we could see a lovely, curving, pebbly beach of white sand. Seagulls cry overhead in the salt wind. Next to us is an open field of Hancock Street, full of wood chips and our fellow citizens. What we are watching is the launching of a ship. Thousands of people, writes the Argus the very next day, men, women, children, in carriages and on foot, were gathered together near Captain Dyer's shipyard on Saturday forenoon to see the steamboat General Warren launched. She ran down over the ways beautifully till she nearly touched the water when some portion of the ways gave way and she settled so much that when about half her length was in the water, she stopped. Now we learn from Captain D that the boat is not injured in the least and it will uh, get off without difficulty at 12 o'clock today. An old man by the name of Warren, who was slightly demented, had been lowered aboard dressed in full uniform with a sword at his side. As the vessel went over the seawall and the waves parted and she stuck in the mud with a somewhat disastrous effect to the martial looking Warren who is thrown on the deck in a most undignified manner. So ends the Eastern Argus. As the last launching of any vessel in this area, it's somewhat fitting, you know, that the ship slipped past the Stevenson mansion which had been the birthplace of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, his aunt and uncle's home. The author of the poem, The Building of the Ship, and the site of George Cleves and Mr. Uh, Tucker's pioneering homestead in 1632. Within a few years of this event, Four Street shipyards would be replaced, and indeed they would be, by rail yards. The port, this part of Portland, where we are standing, is so far out from the center of town and is nicknamed Jaffa, a place far away. But it is the center of our story. This is where old Portland was born. 
and to which we will return in our story. Portland, its face to the mountains, its feet in the sea. For 300 more and more years, the sea has been our resource, our savior, our neighbor, and sometimes our friend. It has been said by one historian of Portland that across the years, the city successfully switched and handled well about 11 different lines of commerce, from mast pines for the Royal Navy, to shook, meaning barrel staves, for molasses, to sea harvests of all kind, to today's tourists, and entertainment, and a container port, all proving, despite all dangers, all disappointments, all disasters, our city slogan, Resurgium, I shall rise again. Now, ironically, the path that the General Warren took that day, being launched from Dyer's shipyard to the sea, can be walked and traced today, no difficulty. It starts in uh, what would be the front yard of the Shipyard Brewing Company, hence the name, then through the middle of the building of a hotel, then across Old Forest Street to a parking lot, then across a railroad, then across reconstructed Thames Street, through another parking lot, and then straight through the Ocean Gate Terminal, back to the sea. The beach is long gone replaced by maybe a thousand feet of asphalt and iron. But the route to Portland's harbor is the route we're going to take tonight. Portland's story, the journey from the age of sail to the age of rail to the age of the auto and back to the age of the ocean again. Portland's past to our present. It's worth tracing again. Now along the way, we're going to meet merchant princes, prizes of great value, decisions, and disasters of lesser value. But I've also given you something to uh, be helpful, I hope, and that is the rig silhouette that some of you have been so fortunate as to pick up. To those who came before us, a ship meant a specific thing. A brig meant something else. A bark, yet again, something different. A yawl or a brigantine or a schooner all meant different things, as familiar to the children of that world as the latest uh, Halo game is on the internet to the students of today. So this, if you are fortunate enough to have one, is meant to help as we march along. For 125 years, vessels had been launched in the Dyer Yard. General Warren is the last launching from that yard. It is a screw steam propeller, the words they used for it then. It's symbolic too. It had both mass and a steam engine and a propeller. It's a hybrid. It's in transition, in a time of great transition. This is the nick of time when Portland is making the transition from a ship building port to a ship ing port. And the difference is profound. But to begin at the beginning, as Dickens always said, Portland's first shipyard, you can still sort of find. It was at the foot of India Street. Today it would be buried under Commercial Street and the filled land and the docks and the parking lots. Our own Reverend Thomas Smith, who came to Portland in 1772 and stayed and wrote about us for almost 70 years, in August 1727 tells his diary, the sloop built before my door was launched today. Now, Reverend Smith lived in what would be today more or less the front lawn of Temple Etzhaim on Congress Street facing down India. Um, it was a straight shot down India Street to the sea in those days, much closer then, of course. Uh, and the yard would be under commercial today, but he could have seen all that was being done. Now that too is part of Portland's story as a city of ships and the merchant princes that made them. Their world and their waterfront is totally gone, absolutely <coughs> vanished, buried forever under Commercial Street. And that too, the transit to that, is part of our story tonight. 
If you walk the old waterfront with old Reverend Smith or with young Henry Longfellow, you'd be walking the crooked, wandering Four Street, which hugged the harbor shoreline. An early shipyard was Lemuel Dyer's, father of the Joseph, whose yard launched the General Warren. And it was on Four Street at Clay Cove. You may stand atop Clay Cove exactly today where the Casca Bay Island Transit District, parking garage, and ferry slip are. That part of Commercial Street. This was Portland's first industrial center. Here, the Dyers, in this case, Lemuel, father of Joseph, built and launched small brigs and brigantines uh, for the West Indies trade. Here, where the Dyer Ways entered the sea, was a marine railway, and they called it that. They were parallel wood tracks up which a boat could be winched or down which it could slide into the sea. The wharves the Dyers built stretched out on all sides and in fact enclosed a small salt lagoon. Their ships were short launched into Clay Cove, which uh, lagoon was filled with logs which would pile up in front of the bows of the oncoming ship and lessen the momentum and prevent them from rushing out into the flats. To get them out of the cove, one had to pull up the planks of the bridge, which connected Thames Street, T-H-A-M-E-S, to the main railway that the Dyers ran. Had to pull the vessels through the gap out into the harbor, and then build it all back again so you could continue to use the bridge. And we think it's tough to cross Commercial Street today. Lemuel Dyer passed in 1847, accidentally working in the woods in Hiram in Oxford County, Maine, not far from where I come, felling timber for the next year's work. And his yard will not much uh, last longer than he, as we shall see. But let's walk, continuing westward, toward a much larger yard, toward where today the Portland South Portland Bridge is, or close to. The next yard over, no planks to take up there, was known for the vast vessels that it built. This was the Robert Knight Yard. Uh, and there he would build magnificent vessels with names to match. The Astrakhan of 536 tons, the Ozark of 392 tons. This in the days of man-hauled winches and hands-on hammering. The Astrakhan was a full-rigged ship. It was kettle-bottomed, fast and big for the cotton-carrying trade. Um, coming home from Calcutta, legend says once she made 10 knots a day for 10 days straight, which, if true, is absolutely incredible, and set the tone for Portland's fast sailing ships. Next continuing toward the bridge, would be the Ralph Kelly Yard, where he built the Cora Lynn in 1848, one of the best vessels ever built at Portland. It was the first transatlantic sailing packet between New York City and Glasgow. And then above the bridge, that is going up the Four River, past today's Portland South Portland Bridge, was the G.W. Lawrence Yard, exactly on West Commercial Street, and I mean exactly, where into the 1950s, the Bernstein and Jacobson salvage docks were located. You can still see some of the pilings and the old wooden docks there, gray and ancient in the water. And where today, Sprague's expanding yacht repair complex is. Exactly that spot. Here, Lawrence built the largest vessels ever built in Portland's inner harbor. Lawrence built fast, and he built big. The ship Sebago of 1,258 tons was built in 1864, followed by the Eugenie of 454 tons, and probably the largest vessel that I can prove was actually built within the city limits of Portland, the Majestic in 1866, 
well named 1,170 tongues. The majestic was a down easter. That means it was somewhat like a clipper ship, long, narrow, sharp bows, cut the water rather than plowed it. But it was not quite so sleek. It was square rigged like a ship. And it swept all of the seven seas, was still in service in December 1892 when she disappeared with all her crew going from Seattle to San Francisco. She's perhaps <coughs> Portland's very last city-built ship, still on the waves of the world when she vanishes in 1892. Now, during the Civil War, the Lawrence Yard built ironclad, double-ended gunboats for the United States Navy. Uh, double-ended so they could go up and down the narrow rivers of the west and the south without having to turn around. Um, grand names, the Agawam and the Pontusic, built in 1863, and the Monitor, the Wasak, built in 1864, towed down the harbor. They were fitted out with high, high-performing, mighty iron engines uh, to, at today's Portland Company complex. They were tested by running at full speed, but tethered to the dock for 90 hours straight. Indeed, successful. When the Confederates, in fact, raided Portland Harbor in 1863, they were after the Agawam and Pontusic, but the Portland Company was simply too mighty to invade. It's a story for another lecture, but one of the most successful Confederate invasions of the North and the northernmost naval battle fought in American waters in the Civil War is the Battle of Portland Harbor and the explosion of the ships that they took and the failure of their mission in June 1863. Long covered over, long forgotten, because the Battle of Gettysburg takes the newspaper headlines within a few days after that occasion. Now, but we're at the Portland Company. We've walked back that far. Oh, it's good to stop there. It is the reason Portland is not a shipbuilding hub after the year 1850. The Portland Company was built by John Alfred Poor, a railroad man, not a sailing man and a remarkable man. The name J.A. Poor meant railroads, and railroads meant commercial street. He's the first of the merchant princes we're going to visit tonight. He's a remarkable fellow. He'd be remarkable today. He boomed once in his newspaper, Maine is a region of the earth where physical exertion is a pleasure, where continuous labor invigorates rather than exhausts the human frame quote unquote, but I wish I had students like that. <laughs> no one fits that description better than John A. Poor himself. He's the father of what we call Commercial Street today. He's a prophet. He is a gospel speaker. Um, he's the father of Commercial Street, promoter extraordinaire who uh, brought the future to the Portland waterfront in a burst of steam and boundless energy in the 1850s. Few men ever did more to change the face of Maine in the age of the iron horse than he. He was born in Andover, Maine, a tiny town in Oxford County. Uh, in 1808, he's one year younger than Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. He's the son of a country doctor. And he's a very promising young lawyer who'd even argued cases with Daniel Webster. When at the age of 26, he was thunderstruck by the sight of the first steam locomotive in all New England chugging off from Boston toward Newton, Massachusetts. And I reflected in my later years, he wrote, that the locomotive engine grew into a greatness in my mind that left all other created things far behind it as marvels and wonders. In 1843, he abandons his law practice for Portland, and there he preached to a willing audience the gospel of the railroad all his life. We don't have much time to speak about him, and I regret that, because nothing he ever dreamed of was ever small. In the 1840s, he envisioned Maine as the nexus of a vast international railway, it was two words in those days, of steamships and railroads that would be built here and funnel the commerce of Canada and the wealth of Europe through Portland, Maine. Like a grand panorama, he wrote, and the coast of Maine 
shall be lined with cities surpassing those found on the English Channel and the Baltic Sea. Many of us may know of his great adventure that uh, resulted in Portland being the winter wheat port for Canada. Portland's closer to Europe then and now by uh, sail than any other port in America. But Boston's bankers were much closer to the politicians of Montreal in 1845 or seeking a winter port for Canadian trade. John A. Poor single-handedly turned the tide by driving non-stop alone in an open sleigh from Portland to Montreal through Dixfield Notch in a howling February blizzard and bursting in on the astonished Canadians with a torrent of facts and figures promoting Portland. <laughs> he nearly died. <clears throat> when his presentation was over, he went to his hotel room and slept for 17 hours. His bearskin coat was frozen upright in the sleigh. The only part of it that could move was the whip arm. And yet he streams down the central streets of Montreal with an American flag streaming behind him and exhausted horses that died in their tracks when he arrived. Absolutely amazing. Um, very few things could contain John A. Poor's dreams. He dreamed of a transcontinental railroad to be built from Portland to California via Chicago. And the European and North American railroad that would link Portland and Bangor to London via steamships. Your train would roll onto a steamship here in Portland. The tracks would interconnect. Your cars would roll onto that. You'd cross the Atlantic. And in London, you'd pull up to another dock. And your train would roll off again. You could spend the whole voyage by train in your berth. <laughs> Remarkable. We have to jump ahead, unfortunately. Um, his great dreams, in this sense, don't come true. But he believes that uh, if you connect Portland's two railheads, foot of India, foot of uh, State Street, with a single railroad, two words in those days, then you would have a great commercial way, that he called it, 100 feet wide, one mile long, 20 feet in the, rail, in the middle of it for the railroads forever, because there'll always be sailing ships and railroads, right? And this would therefore make Portland the place to both land and to leave the United States of America. This idea is presented to an international convention in 1850 at Portland's Bunting Bedecked City Hall with John A. Poor as chairman. And it adjourns Portland's papers proudly noted with three notable and astounding cheers. Well, what, it, what happens here is that uh, Commercial Street literally buries Portland's old waterfront. The existing wharves, which you can walk down today, were simply extended out from the 4th Street shore out into the bay. Commercial Street was built using, as uh, John A. Poor proudly pointed out, a steam power horses and a lot of Irishmen, quote unquote, <laughs> who cut down hills and filled it all in. If you go to the land side of Commercial Street, you can find that there are still buildings there with two level basements that back up to 4th Street so you could offload your ship, whatever the tide, <coughs> high or low. And on the water side of commercial, many of them are exactly the same. To see the original harbor seawall of Portland, go into the Old Port Tavern and go to the side that faces Commercial Street. That is the brick wall that held back the Atlantic. That is the granite that held the piers where today Portland uh, uh, now goes out in land. But what this does is seal Portland Harbor off from shipbuilding. Now, you can't build there any longer, so where do you go? Now, it may be of interest to you to know that it's hard to imagine, but vessels were actually built on Back Cove near Deering's Bridge. Today, this is solid land on Forest Avenue near where Kennebec Street and Marginal Wayne join Forest Avenue just north of the Portland Post Office, if you're going out of town. It's uh, right by Deering Oaks. <coughs> the clover leaves of Interstate I-295 come down upon it now. Believe it or not, ships were built there. Hiram Jordan built the brig Emden there in 1825, and the bark Canada in 1841. He could launch them directly into the waters of Back Cove. 
fact, till 1904, you could have rowed a small boat from the ponds of Deering Oaks under the bridge right directly into Back Cove. That all ended when they built the extension of State Street. So why not Back Cove? Well, the problem then and today is that it's 60 acres of shallow mud flats, and that's the reason. If it had been a deep water ocean inlet, it would be very different today, and Portland's history would be different. But Tukey's Bridge and the flats there um, pretty much keep the water very shallow. It's still shallow, still muddy. So we have a dilemma. Portland Waterfront has turned its back on shipbuilding. Back Bay is a bathtub of mud. You can't use it. We go a little further northward to what they in their day called North Portland, which today we call East Deering. And while we trudge toward North Portland, uh, let's look over our shoulder, um, that shoulder on which we're carrying a shipbuilder's ax and an ads. We're gonna look back toward town because you can smell molasses there. It was said that Salem, Mass. had her East Indies in the 19th century and Portland, Maine had its West Indies. And from the West Indies, we brought back Portland's treasure. Examples, 1787, of 89 vessels clearing out of Portland Harbor, 73 were bound for the West Indies and the Caribbean. In 1826, six years after statehood, one-tenth of all shipping from around the entire world, the globe, bar nothing, that entered Havana Harbor, one-tenth of all the vessels were from Portland, Maine. In 1860, over six million gallons of molasses in one year entered Havana, from Havana into Portland, Maine. Now, we send them cattle, timber, wood, and shook Shook meant the makings of a barrel, barrel staves, or the makings of a box, flattened. One package, one box. One uh, package of uh, shook, one barrel. Um, in return, they send us molasses. Now, what do we use molasses for? Ah, sugar making. Ah, and rum making. Neil Dow, I could tell this was a prohibition crowd, so I, I thought I'd have to explain that. Neil Dow notwithstanding, uh, Portland, Maine was the third largest sugar exporter in the United States for much of the 19th century. Granulated sugar would look no different than what you find on your table today. And we are one of the top three rum exporters in the United States. This is quite aside from the personal importing that despite the law went on all the time. And this is our second merchant prince that makes it possible. The Horatio Alger story has nothing over John Bundy Brown, J.B. Brown, a Commercial Street's most remarkable merchant prince who rises from rags to riches on a taste of sweetness that is born to Portland's waterfront. Now, he was born in 1805 in Lancaster, New Hampshire, one of the 10 children of a tavern keeper. And he comes to Portland as a $1 a week grocery store in Alpheus Shaw's very first Shaw's store down on Middle Street. At 23, the ambitious young man, Brown, joins his fellow clerk, St. John Smith, in their own grocery business. And they are soon importing large quantities of sugar and molasses. And it's molasses that spells success. For with a shrewd eye for what the public wanted, Brown seizes upon new technology that refines humble brown sugar, like you still use to cook today, into fancy yellow and white. He knows what the public wants, and in short order, the, his Sugar House, two words, capital S, capital H, thought to be the third largest in America, standing at York and Maple Street, was a resounding success. He employs 200 people, processes 30,000 hogsheads. A hogshead is 164 gallons. You could climb inside a hogshead. That's how big the hogshead is. Um, it goes through um, 30,000 of those a year and puts out 250 barrels of sugar a day, all carried away on his own ships. Now, we know the story of Portland. Success goes up in smoke on July 4th, 1866, uh, and burns his factory to the ground, except that shrewdness saved the day for he collects his insurance in solid gold from Scottish and English firms. Now, he rebuilds the sugar house, part of the building that exists today, the corner of, of Maple 
and commercial is part of the 1866 structure. Um, but he pours his fortune instead into uh, building enormous structures throughout the rest of the city. He builds the Lancaster Building in uh, Monument Square. Remember Loring Short and Harmon? That's the Lancaster Building. Lancaster, because that's where he was born. Lancaster, New Hampshire. Builds the 240-room Falmouth Hotel. It's the very largest north of Boston. I don't remember it. There may be a few in the audience that do. It was torn down in the 1960s. He builds the majority of the main general hospital, today a main medical center. Um, by 1880, he is Portland's single largest landowner. He pays 1 30th of the entire city's property taxes. And his vast estate, Bram Hall, which stood atop our hill of the same name, boasted lawns that stretched literally a quarter mile in every direction from his front door. You know, we're all mortal. He dies in 1881 from a simple fall on the ice, of all things. And his obituary in a Boston paper declares he was emphatically the architect of his own fortune and the fortunes of many another man. And he won his way upward to a proud summit by dint of industry, which knew no relaxation, and perseverance, which never quailed before obstacles. And indeed, it never did. You know, portraits of this, he looks as a very grim looking, gray, foreboding, pouch eyed, stern capitalist. And he always posed in great fur collars to emphasize his wealth. And yet, there was another side to him. He left a very generous scholarship to Bowdoin to help promising little boys from Portland who, like himself, started life with ambition and one dollar. And the Brown Medals, named for his son, John O. Brown, who died young, which are still given at Portland High to uh, young students who do well academically. If you stand with the Portland School of Art at your back, or Rennie's, and look across the street to the brick building which occupies an entire block there, look above the center door, you'll see the name J.B. Brown inscribed, blown up and inscribed. When it fills in the wintertime with snow, it looks just like somebody sugared it. He'd like that very much. <laughs> It was born of success on Commercial Street. Well, now while I've been talking, we've reached East Deering. And here, in the yards of East Deering, which would be, if you're heading northward out of Portland, of course, on the land side, uh, were the coves that held one of Portland's most remarkable but unremembered merchant princes, who plays a huge part in the city's story and the story of Portland, Maine at sea. He was my favorite shipbuilder. His name is Jacob S. Winslow. Now he lived at 14 Deering Street. And you can still stand on his stoop today, as I did, just coming here tonight. Now he comes from Pembroke, Maine, born December 19th, 1827. Maine had been a state only seven years at that time. And he grew up in Lubeck, the furthest corner east of the United States, near Canada, facing sunrise and the sea. He went to sea at age 14 and commanded his own small vessel at 17. In the year 1846, the young United States has gone to war with Mexico that year. Young Abraham Lincoln has entered his one undistinguished term in Congress, and Henry David Thoreau is living at Walden Pond that year. But he thrives and he works hard. In 1861, at age 34, he retires from the quarterdeck and he establishes the firm of J.S. Winslow and Company in Portland. And he stands at that helm for 41 years. Now, Winslow Company is a ship builder and a ship chandler. That is, meaning he builds vessels and then provides for their needs. There are still ship chandlers in Portland and very ancient ones who do well. In these yards at East Deering, Maine, and in yards in Bath where he had an interest, uh, in time he creates, owns, and controls the largest fleet of sailing vessels on the east coast of the United States, which is saying something. No one person from Maine, or for that matter, from American history that I can figure, has ever owned alone so many vessels. Not the great Donald Mackay, the builder of, 
of, uh, of clippers, not the great uh, General Hyde at Bath. Those were built for other people. Winslow built for himself and sails them under his house flag, which was a famous blue W on a white field, simple and visible. It floated at the masthead of ships, brigs, barks, schooners, in all parts of the world for almost half a century. I'm going to divert a minute here to tell you about the names of these vessels. Now, there's a great deal of superstition that surrounds the lore of the sea. Much superstition about building, naming, and running ships. There's a lot of belief in signs and in luck and in the stars. You know, the stars guide the ship at sea, so they might guide it at birth and in birth as well. Such as, no ship is ever launched on a Friday. Bath Iron Works still will not launch a ship on a Friday. Names beginning with an A were considered unlucky. Men's names were unlucky as a rule. Since the sea is feminine, i.e. unpredictable, alluring, whimsy-driven, and mysterious, <laughs> his words, not mine. <laughs> Thus, ships are feminine. Even if they're named for a man or a mountain, ships are still referred to as she, and they still are. Now, in time, successful men's names were okay. Kings, admirals, explorers, the famous, captains of men and captains of industry, like the Winslows and their friends. And in time, many vessels do bear names beginning with A, in fact, the last full-rigged a uh, wooden ship built in America, the Arian, is one such. And it is considered extraordinarily unlucky, however, to change the name of a vessel unless it's with the change of ownership too. The Julie N., the ship that hit the bridge here in Portland so many years ago, and uh, doused the harbor with the largest oil spill in history. Even then, they would not change the name of the Julie N until it was sold and the name was changed. It would have been too unlucky to have done so. And there's many an example where an old salt could say, well, I told you so. You should have followed the rules. Uh, but the sea runs the show always. You know, in time, the sea speaks to all, but it answers to none. And after all, as Shakespeare reminds us, the fault, dear Brutus, lies not in our stars, but in ourselves. All the big Winslow schooners are eventually named for people, except one, the very last, uh, which was built uh, in uh, the Persian small yard up in uh, Bath, in which uh, Winslow had a share, and that would be the Wyoming, the longest and the biggest of them all, and the last. Now, even in time and at last, one vessel is named for Jacob S. Winslow himself. The J.S. Winslow, built in East Deering, Maine, 1869, a little bark of 524 uh, tons. In time, Jacob Winslow entices um, a uh, fellow townsman from Pembroke, George Russell, to relocate from Pembroke to Portland with his four mighty brothers. And they go to work in the Winslow Yards in East Deering. And they go to work with a will for him. Uh, with that mighty quintet, the hammers never stop falling in Deering. From 1864 to 1891, from the great first breath to the very last sigh of the wooden ship, the Russell Yard, the Winslow Yard, builds 51 wooden sailing vessels. And they go all the way from the little tiny Rachel of 403 tons, their very first, built 1864, to their very last, the Rhode Island of 1891, 643 tons. They build sailing vessels of all kinds. They're on your handout. Barks, schooners, barkentines. They build three ships. I mean, properly ships, real ships, 
what we think of when we think of a ship. Square rigged, three high masts, sails spread across the width of the vessel. The beau ideal of a ship in the classic sense. The largest ship built in that yard here in Portland, Maine was the William C. Davis, 1,668 tons, thus the largest ever built in Portland, Maine. And the best ship, the Rufus Wood, 1875, she was swift and sweet. She once ran from the Golden Gate, San Francisco, to Queenstown, Australia in 108 days. That's a miracle. And once, laden with grain, she rounded Cape Horn, around the bottom of the world, and ran over 200 miles a day for eight days straight in the arms of a mighty wind, one day making 307 miles and a second day making 296 miles. These are maximums, these are records for wooden ships which still stand, and they will stand forever because we're not making any wooden ships now to challenge them. A Portland ship. Such were the Portland vessels which slipped from Deering Ways and went around the promenade, went below the observatory, past Portland Headlight, out to the winds of the world. I should explain what is a schooner and what is a ship. Winslow builds mostly schooners. A ship would have three masts. The sails are astride the ship, like the seats on a bus. A schooner, on the other hand, has sails that run fore and aft along the vessel, like the aisle in a bus. Um, Winslow is known as the schooner king. On your handouts now, you know what to, to look for. To historians who write about them, and to Americans who built them, schooners are known as the, quote, last stand of sail. And they are. Schooners are vessels used in the coastwide trade, and America's last big wind-driven vessels ever built. Winslow's fleet of big fore and afters are coastwise. They're practical, they're economical, they're speedy. They hug the coast and they hop from port to port, harbor to harbor. They could, and they did, go to the Caribbean, to the West Indies, and to Central American ports, uh, carrying coal and lumber and case oil, oil in cases. Um, and they thus take Maine pine and spruce and ingenuity into southern waters. But out in the open ocean, they were out in the deep blue water, in the long voyages into the Atlantic, far from land, um, out in the fist of the open wind, schooners were, says one historian, invariably disappointing, disillusioning, even disastrous. You could run them, however, with a smaller crew than a large square master. A square-rigged ship took usually 54 men plus officers, at least, to wrestle all those sails by hand. There were 204 running lines on a three-masted ship. Standing rigging is the black tarred rigging that holds the masts upright. That's the stuff you see uh, Captain Jack Sparrow and his men clambering up to get up into the yards. Um, there are 11 lines, which means the ropes, the running rigging. You would be a landlubber if you called them ropes. They're lines uh, that maneuver every sail. There are 16 commands to each of those 11 ropes to make the sails do what you want. It's all done by hand, you going up there to do it. Whatever the weather, one hand for the ship, one for yourself is the phrase. Now a schooner, however, you could raise and lower the sails using steam power. And a crew of 18 could handle a schooner, or as few as 11. The Wyoming, the biggest wooden sailing ship we built in Maine, almost as big as the state for which it's named, the largest and last of them all have a crew of 11. The problem with vessels that big is that they were ungainly, they were lazy, they were logy, they were hard to control. If you were standing at the uh, stern of the vessel in a heavy sea, you could see the waves coming down the vessel, that is, the wood would flex. You'd see the wave coming in the ship like this towards you, enough to give you concern. 
The top building years for the Winslow Yards were 1875 to 1877, as we said. And here's a sample. These are ships of long life that sail out of East Deering's codes. The Carey Reed, 1870, 1,362 tons. She was still sailing and sold to the Germans, still at work in 1910. There's some evidence she may have sailed for the Kaiser in World War I. Or the J.B. Brown, named for our own man, 1874, 1,551 tons. It was auctioned off at last in Portugal for parts in the year 1903. Still sound, still sailing, very long lives. There were some tragic lives too. The James Bailey, 1878, 1,530 tons, lost at sea, Hong Kong to San Francisco in 1880. No trace of it ever found. Just like the vessel with five main uh, graduates from uh, Castine upon it that vanishes. It has been found, but all hands lost. Or well, the Philomene Winslow, 1876, 2,170 tons on uh, a voyage um, loaded with coal from Cardiff to Singapore. She's lost in the South Atlantic. Or the St. John Smith, 1883, named for J.B. Brown's old partner. It's a bark of 1,820 tons. And from Liverpool to San Francisco, she simply, quote, went missing, unquote. Never seen, never found. They sail off into mystery. By 1891, all main scone schooners are bound for that same mysterious shore. Why? Well, steam power is invented. Now, steam power can hoist the schooner's sails and replace crew men, and it re soon replaces the schooner itself. For example, the Great Portland Company, founded in 1846 during this era, is churning out Ironically, the very replacement for the schooner. They produce in their allotted years at the Portland Company over 600 steam locomotives. What you think of when you think of a steam locomotive, big, black, booming, brassy, bossy, roaring away. And America looks westward now by rail, not east by sail. And down those long ribbons of steel rolls manifest destiny. Go west. Young man, writes the editorialist, not uh, go seek two years before the mast, young man. Bath Iron Works is also created during this period of time, the era of iron ships built by iron men, as the phrase goes. No iron ships are ever built in Portland except the uh, vessels for the Civil War that I have mentioned. During this very nick of time, Sarah Orne Jewett writes her sweet book, Country of the Pointed Furs. It's about a way of life along coastal Maine that's passing as she pens it, and she knows it. It's sailing away as she writes, as it were. You know, I think Jacob Winslow knows it too. The last of Portland's great shipbuilders passes away with the century. Perhaps it was the perfect time to go, if there such there be. It was said of him that he helped more young men to start in life than almost any man in Portland. And among his captains and all employees, his name shall stand above all others for integrity and kindness and fair dealings and all. This ends with his death. Jacob Winslow lived across the street from John A. Poor. John A. Poor lived and died and had his funeral from one side of Deering Street, exactly opposite his house, Jacob S. Winslow lived and died and had his funeral in the year 1902. More symbolic about the age of rail and the age of sail, you couldn't imagine. You know, you cannot see any of Jacob S. Winslow's life work now. All his ships are gone to the embrace of the sea where they lived. Uh, they're only in memory or in photographs that try to capture them, but King Neptune eventually took them all. However, you can see Captain Jacob S. Winslow if you want 
Uh, his uh, resting place in Evergreen Cemetery is topped by a fine, full-length granite statue of Jacob S. Winslow, very tall, very strong, looking across the green fields and treetops toward the distant horizon. You know, he faces the sea. It is one of only two sculptures in granite ever done by that excellent, eminent carver of ship's figureheads, Portlander's own wood carver, Edward Souther Griffin. The only other statue of his that you can see in granite is that of the Portland firefighter, which stands in front of Central Fire Station on Congress Street. The irony is almost none of his wooden figure work survives today either. Maybe a handful of filigrees and fragments in a few museums. It's all at the bottom of the sea, just like the Winslow fleet. And so memory, and so elegy. Now, we're back at Dyer's boatyard now. The General Warren is launched. It's finally gotten off the ways. We've come to the end of our walk around the waterfront. Old Portland's shipbuilding coves are buried beneath Commercial Street. But you know, we still celebrate uh, its heritage in restaurants, bars, and PR, our seafront heritage. And we still set sail to the islands of Casco Bay every day from the Casco Bay lines, which stand directly atop Clay Cove, where all of this started. You can see a little bit of the East Deering Yards. Um, there the roads roar by some pilings and old stone walls of the ancient yards. Look quick as you rush by, you might see a bit of it. And where the General Warren went to sea, now tourists arrive by sea. It's called Ocean Gate. And vessels they leave are built larger than ever were dreamed of in Dyer's day. So we've gone from building ships to birthing ships. Merchant princes, John Alfred Poor, John Bundy Brown, Jacob S. Winslow, men of that vision are gone now. Today's merchant princes, of course, are real. Lawyers, bankers, developers. Well, so were all those other fellows, Mr. Poor, Mr. Brown, Mr. Winslow once. Is there anything made by man, we can love as he does a ship, as Charles Francis Adams, Secretary of the Navy for uh, President Hoover. And it's a very good question. One of the greatest historians of the age of sail, Mr. Chappelle, writes in his final book, one by one, these great vessels meet the common fate of ships and of men. Men like ships, never quite live out their days. Now men, such men and such ships are gone. How still they lie, the dead captains of ships, of men, of industry, once so alive. Now they rest on quiet New England hillsides, think Eastern Cemetery, overlooking the white-flecked waters for which they held a love surpassing the love of all things. How languidly they dream away the hours who once lived years in moments, whose souls clashed with the lightning and hurricane and gloried in the tempest with a strange calm glory. Gone are the mountain surges, the gray beards of the sea, the steady drone of the storm, the mighty rushing waters, the shrill of orders, bugle clear above the gale, the call to more than human deeds. In their place, the softly falling snow, the grasses slowly stirring, the sound of gently rustling leaves and friendly wrens to mock the stately gulls. The old, the old captains are dreaming now and their ships are outward bound. It's never wise to get a politician to the podium, because now, if the, though we're right at the witching hour, if you have some questions, I'll try to answer them, if you can express them crisply. Yes. 
Are the are the poorhouse and the uh, the Winslow house still still do they still exist? The poor house, indeed, uh, the woman who lives in it calls it that. She says, I'm proud to live in the poor house. It very much still exists. Uh, I know the person that lives in poor's apartments uh, downstairs where his funeral is held. And the Winslow house is right across the street. Absolutely. In fact, the house to which it is joined was the Harmon house. Uh, remember Lauren Shorten Harmon? Charles Harmon had lived in that house, who was lost at sea, oddly enough, uh, many years later. So they're there, they're very lovely, and they're in good hands. Um, the Winslow House, in fact, had been lived in by a, a doctor, and his son, I can't remember the son's name, just passed. His son, who grew up in the Winslow House on Deering Street, wrote the song Lemon Tree. That song, you hear it in your head? Yeah. So all sorts of stuff on Deering Street. Yes, uh, yeah, Steve, I think. Yeah, yeah, Steve. Thanks, sir. It was my understanding that the Poland Fire Museum, the big wooden carved eagle up on the wall, is a piece of Edward Southwick Griffin's handiwork. So that you all may hear, my friend Steve asks, is it so that the uh, big eagle, which is at the Portland Fire Museum on Spring Street now, the carved wooden eagle, was a work of Edward Southwick Griffin? I don't know. This would be well worth finding out. You may have told us something that uh, we should be very pleased to know. Yes, front row. When you describe the size of the ship in tonnage, what does that really mean? Question is, what does the size of a ship in tonnage mean when you describe it that? It's not how much it weighed, the vessel. It's how much it would displace and could carry. Uh -huh. So you could carry uh, no more than you can displace in water. Uh, so 1,600 uh, tons is a lot. You can imagine what an aircraft carrier displaces uh, for a steel ship that steel can float. There was serious discussion in the journals of the day. You couldn't build vessels of metal. They'd sink. Well, Henry Hyde, uh, 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 Thomas Hyde proved them wrong. Uh, but that's what tonnage means, and, and that's how it goes. When you speak of these big ships, they were vast for their moments. Vast. Yes. I was on an aircraft carrier Vietnam, it's 80,000 tons. You are on an aircraft carrier, it's 80,000 tons. Yeah, Think of USS that. America. USS, yeah. great name, too. Think of that, isn't that wonderful? 80,000 tons. Now it gives you a real impression of how much weight that is and what it means. We'll probably take one more question. Uh, yes, yes, I uh, think that's have, my neighbor. Yes, hello. You have a hello. chance to, to uh, run across what happened to the Iron Clans that we built in Portland? Can you say again, please? The ironclads that were built in Portland. Ah, the ironclads that were built in Portland. The Agawam and the Pontusik. Uh, they both survived the war. Recently, they actually found pictures of them, photographs, along with other ironclads out in the Mississippi River. And you can look them up. They were both scrapped in, after the wars. They, they lasted to the 1880s, and the iron was worth more than the, the vessel. One of the most famous monitors of the Civil War, monitors, you know, like the so-called cheese box on a raft, was the Montauk, upon which the Lincoln conspirators were kept as prisoners, and John Wilkes Booth autopsy was performed. And the Montauk ended up stationed in Portland Harbor uh, during the Spanish-American War. Frightened the Spanish so bad they left, left us alone. <laughs> well, I guess. That will do it. We're glad to see you after. Our thanks to our friends at, uh, at the Portland Landmarks. And on to the very next lecture about which you can pick up great information uh, right outside at the, the table. Thank you all.